Most of you will know someone who has or has had cancer. Data shows that one out of two people will be diagnosed from cancer within their lifetime. It's scary, isn't it? Luckily, cancer survival has been increasing. It has indeed doubled in the past 40 years. And this has the potential of getting better. There are treatments that are currently being developed that have the promise of actually curing some types of cancer. But as we all know, some of these cancer treatments are very toxic because they not only kill cancer cells, they also kill the healthy cells, and then the side effects are just too much. I have been doing cancer research for the past eight years, and I have started a biotech company with the aim of improving the lives of cancer patients. It's been quite a journey, <laughs> and it all started when I was 15 years old. So let me tell you how. When I was 15 years old, I actually wanted to be an architect or a journalist. So if things would have done, gone a very different way, I would be here talking to you about a completely different topic, mainly uh, maybe about, I don't know, sustainable architecture. Um, so why am I here talking to you about cancer treatments? Why do I care about them, and when did I start caring about them? So it was when I was 15 years old that both my aunt and uncle were diagnosed with cancer. She survived, she's still with us, but he died after suffering different treatments and surgeries. So it left me with a very puzzling feeling. I couldn't understand why two people with the same disease could have such a different outcome. And the more I read about it, the more I understood that there's a lot of things that we don't know about cancer. But I guess the strongest feeling that I had was frustration, because it just seemed to me like I could do nothing to make things better. But I actually had one choice. And it turns out I wasn't going to become an architect anymore. So I started thinking about what could I do to try and make a little impact in the cancer research field. And at that point, it seemed to me like I had two clear options. One was to become a doctor, someone that could actually treat patients. The other one was to become a scientist, someone that could do research. The first option seemed like the best idea. So it would have given me more stable career options, better society recognition, and I actually had a lot of my teachers and some family members telling me that that was the smart choice. So I was actually thinking differently. I thought that it was going to be through science that I had the biggest chances of actually making little improvements in the cancer field, discovering something new, even if it was just a tiny mechanism that cancer cells use to spread. So I became a scientist. That decision has taken me to live in six different cities around the world. I've had the chance of doing research with people from everywhere, more or less, and researching loads of different topics. So it all started when I had to move from my hometown, Lleida, to do my undergrad in Barcelona. It took quite a lot of persuasion to get my parents to believe that that was going to be the best career option I could ever take. Um, but I ended up in Barcelona. Then I spent two summers doing research in Belgrade and in Oxford. And I ended up in London. So I did my Erasmus in London, I did my master's in London, and I did my PhD as well in cancer research. So after 10 years, long years, <laughs> of academic training, I now had a decision to make. What did I want to do after? What did I want to use my knowledge 
how. And so there were, I guess, if I wanted to stay in science, there were some common career options that I could take. One was to stay in academia. One was to go into industry. And in both of those cases, it would have meant that I had to um, continue doing research and hopefully, in a few years' time, have my own laboratory where I could actually investigate the things that I'm most interested in. But I took neither of those. <laughs> I took a third option, which was a bit more unknown and risky, um, which was actually starting a biotech company. And this is the point of the story where I need to stop talking about me, and I need to start talking about we. Because it wasn't until I met George and Susanna that I actually realized how much impact we could have. So I met those two um, when we were doing our PhDs in Cambridge. We all knew about the problem of how toxic cancer treatments are. And we were wondering why that was. Why, what type of technologies were out there that were trying to address this problem? And what were their pitfalls? Because only by learning about their pitfalls, we could actually come up with solutions to partially or completely overcome those challenges. So the three of us come from pretty different areas in biology. Um, and I believe it was that mix of different skills that allow us to come up with what we thought was a great idea. But as you know, when scientists have great ideas, they need to actually test them. We had to actually perform experiments to understand whether we were crazy or we were right. And in order to do that, we actually needed money. Like, starting a biotech company is very capital intensive. And so we tried to go around the UK looking for investors, for some people that would believe in our idea. And after what seemed to be a pretty long time, um, we realized we had raised no money whatsoever. I think what they had in their head was a biotech company at your age. Good luck. <laughs> so we were still determined and actually very curious to know whether we were right. And so we saw and thought that our only option was to actually go to the US, where investors are able to take um, more risks by investing in earlier stage technologies. So we applied to Y Combinator. This is a startup accelerator that is based in Silicon Valley. And up until the point, um, up until then, they had mainly invested in tech companies. But we still prepare an application. And I mean, I have to admit, it was a very long shot, because it has like lower acceptance rate than Harvard. So it was pretty unlikely <laughs> that we would actually get in. But we went through the first interview. They still wanted to see us for the second interview. And here we are, happy in San Francisco, <laughs> when we actually got into the program. And that was a brilliant moment. Not just because we had received the first investment and we were actually able to do the proof of concept experiments that we wanted to do, but because it allowed us to think big, to actually understand that if we wanted to get there, we had to get there fast, and that making mistakes was just going to be part of the journey. We had to make them. And so after four years, I have four months, sorry, <laughs> in, in Silicon Valley, we came back to the UK. 
So as you might remember, we left the UK with zero dollars in our bank account. And we came back with seven figures. So what was next for us? Now we had the chance of actually build the company that we wanted to build. And it all started with actually having a laboratory where we could actually do our research. So it was a tricky one because we wanted to be in a place where we could actually be able to attract the best talent. We wanted to be in a place where people would want to live in. And we ended up finding the place. We moved in there in October, last October. And since then, our lab has got five times bigger already in the space of eight months. So why do we need that much space? It's not because we want to be very comfortable. Um, one of the key things that we've been doing is actually growing the team. And it's one of the things that I'm most proud of, because we've managed to put together a team of brilliant scientists that all have the same commitment to actually work to improve the lives of cancer patients. We all work in very different disciplines. We work at the interface of biology, chemistry, and computation. Because we believe that it's only through multidisciplinary teams that we're going to be able to tackle the biggest problems. So I guess you're wondering, what do all these people work on? What do we actually do at Sixfold? So we build drug delivery systems. Drug delivery systems are technologies that allow us to attach drugs onto them so that then they can be delivered within the human body more efficiently. So if we look at what types of drug delivery systems are currently being used in patients, um, we have two main areas. One are viral vectors. Those are viruses that encapsulate the therapeutic inside. But as you can imagine, our body is very used to fighting viral infections. It's pretty good at it. So these delivery systems can only be injected locally, either in the muscle or in the eye, in places where the immune system cannot get to that efficiently. The Second option are lipid and polymer-based nanoparticles. When these nanoparticles are injected in the bloodstream, they travel around the body, but they tend to accumulate in the liver, which is great when you're trying to cure a liver disease, but it's not so great when you're trying to uh, deliver the drug somewhere else in the body. And that takes me to what we do. So, We've built a technology that is 100,000 times thinner than one of your hairs. And even though it's tiny, we are able to precisely control and engineer what type of therapy we want to load into, but also which type of cells we want to send it to. So let me tell you a bit more how it works. Um, this is a cancer cell. You can see the cell membrane. And in the cell membrane, you can see that it has different receptors. These receptors, some of these receptors, are only present in cancer cells. So healthy cells don't have those. So what happens is that when we inject our technology into the bloodstream, they travel throughout the body. And then only when they find these receptors, they are able to internalize into the cell. And it's only when the therapy is inside of the cell that it can have its effect, which is either killing the cell or repairing the cell. So this sort of like strategy in which we use receptor expression, it's better illustrated in the next slide. 
So here you have what a healthy like, lung looks like. This is a piece of tissue. And here you see how lung cancers look in two different patients. In brown is a staining that we use to highlight the presence of a specific receptor. And as you can see, that receptor is not present in the healthy tissue. So this is just one of the strategies that we are using in order to be able to selectively send therapeutics to cancer cells. And I got into the drug delivery field because I cared about cancer. But what is exciting about it is that the type of technology that we are building is something that has the potential to be used in the future for the treatment of other types of diseases. Other diseases where the disease cell has the expression of a certain receptor in the surface, such as hemophilia, for example. So it goes beyond cancer. For me, it was cancer. It was cancer that pushed me to take unconventional career decisions. Sometimes slightly more riskier decisions. But it was because I was determined to make an impact in the cancer field. So what about you? What do you care about? What would you want to make an impact in? Thank you.